I just had three different people tell me, you remember how we came out statistics class? You stand back and then come up. Okay. We'll do that. Okay. I know. I just met. I just met. And he's a fellow Alabama boy. Oh yeah. Come here, let me get a picture with the three of us now. Oh yeah. We are Alabama boys. University of Illinois. I know some of you are locals, um, but many of you traveled to be here with us today, um, and we're truly excited to have you here in campus on this beautiful fall day. 
As you may know, Dr. Anderson retired this past June after almost 50 years of service at the University of Illinois. Yeah. Yeah. Today, we're celebrating his scholarship, mentorship, and leadership, as well as his far-reaching impact on individuals and institutions. So this morning's um, program includes a conversation between Dr. Jim Anderson and Dr. Freeman Hrabowski, uh, one of our most accomplished alumni and an inspiration to all who care deeply about improving higher education and especially equity outcomes in STEM education. I had the pleasure of meeting him yesterday at the Chancellor's Medallion Ceremony, and I can honestly say that I cannot wait to hear the conversation with uh, Dr. Anderson. Um, you should be prepared for quite a powerful and inspiring conversation. Um, this conversation will be moderated by two of our distinguished alumni, uh, Dr. DeAndre Cobb Roberts and Dr. Karen Graves. And in fact, between the two of them, they hold six University of Illinois degrees. <laughs> Dr. Karen Graves received her bachelor's in mathematics education, her master's in education policy studies, and her PhD in history of education. She's a professor of Merida of educational studies at Denison University, where she was professor and chair of the Department of Education. During her tenure at Denison, she taught courses in history and philosophy of education, queer studies, and educational policy. Her research addresses 20th century schooling in the United States with a focus on gender and sexuality and legal policies concerning education. While at Denison, she received a number of awards, including the Charles Bregman Teaching Excellence Award and the Charles and Nancy Bregman Distinguished Service Award. She's also um, the distinguished, she also received the Distinguished Alumni Award from our College of Education in 2013. Welcome. <coughs> Dr. DeAndre Cobb Roberts is a professor and interim department chair in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction in the College of Education at the University of South Florida. Uh, she's also affiliate faculty within the Higher Education and Student Affairs Program and Women and Gender Studies. She holds a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's and PhD in education policy studies, all from the University of Illinois. Um, she taught courses in Educator and Literature Preparation, History of American Higher Education, and Social Foundations of Education. Her research focuses on gender races in the faculty and administrative ranks of black women in higher education. She interrogates the structure of power and potentially affects the interpretations of institutional climates, cultures, and experiences, as well as mentoring practices and performances of black women in administration. Um, Dr. Cobb Roberts served as the McKnight Faculty Fellow at the University of South Florida, and she's the recipient of the Distinguished Alumni Award from the College of Education 2011. So welcome both. Um, the entire team on stage exemplifies the transformational power of education at Illinois. Um, it is truly my pleasure to have you all here today, and uh, please give them a round of applause. And <laughs> Thank you, Dean Musa, the College of Education, Amanda Brown, and her team for preparing for this event today, and good to see everyone here. Today's conversation presents a rare opportunity to celebrate the work of an uncommon educator. Few scholars have had as much impact on a field of study as Dr. James Anderson while practicing the art of teaching with such integrity. It matters that we take time this weekend to honor this work because Dr. Anderson has shown us over the course of his career, that it isn't foolish to put our faith in education done right. He has shown us consistently that we cannot separate belief in the dignity of human beings from our democratic projects. Two sentences at the end of Education of Blacks in the South underscore these points with clarity and help us keep our work, our teaching, our scholarly inferences in perspective. I suspect many of you are familiar with these lines. But there is nothing naive about a belief in learning and self-improvement as a means to individual and collective dignity. 
It was not the end of their struggle for freedom and justice, only a means toward that end. Dr. Anderson and Dr. Rabowski were in graduate school at Illinois at a time when a new historiography was emerging in history of education. The collective social movements of the 1960s had exposed multiple problems in American schools and the wider culture, prompting a move away from consensus historiography to critical historiography. Historians, sociologists, and philosophers in the Educational Policy Studies Department led in this intellectual revolution. In his essay on democratic agitations, Dr. Anderson recalled the context, writing, social problems were all too apparent at the end of the 1960s. The burning cities, collapsing urban schools, widespread poverty, government assaults on privacy and individual rights, the Vietnam War, deeply entrenched racial inequality, sexism, and the assassinations and harassment of radical leaders raised fundamental questions about the democratic nature of liberal thought and practice. Taking stock of their own contemporary moment, historians on the third floor of the education building on 6th Street asked new questions from a new perspective. And Dr. Anderson's scholarship was pivotal in this transformation. A discussion of black education is often framed within a context of what was or is lacking as a struggle. The struggle, however, was not by happenstance, but by strategic design. Dr. Anderson's scholarship acknowledges the complicated relationship between African Americans and the multiple systems, for example, political, economic, legal, educational, and social, that were aimed at relegating African Americans to the margins and in many cases to render them invisible. And this unpacks, in this he unpacks how the systems were meant to deter any progress and destroy the souls of black folks. Dr. Anderson has consistently articulated that education for black people was a form of resistance, a form of freedom from oppression, and two, was accompanied by extraordinary sacrifices. Their commitment, our commitment to education was connected to a desire to learn and an appreciation of learning at all costs, life, limb, and oftentimes double taxation. This narrative is in stark contrast to much of what history has written about the education of blacks. His scholarship and experiences have paved the way to an increased and a critical understanding of not only black education, but the history of American education and its contemporary value. In his seminal work, the education, of, the education of Blacks in the South, Anderson notes, former slaves were the first native Southerners to campaign for universal, state-supported public education. In essence, one cannot, should not discuss public education absent of the role played by Blacks in supporting that system. Dr. Anderson also contends in that work that blacks emerged from slavery with a strong belief in the desirability of learning to read and write. Blacks desire assistance without control. The values of self-help and self-determination underlie the ex-slaves educational movement. And we would argue this sentiment, self-help and self-determination, also undergirds the scholarship and philosophy of both Drs. Anderson and Rabowski. So that was the easy part. <clears throat> the more challenging part is to introduce Dr. James D. Anderson. There's a saying that a colleague recently shared with me, and it was simply this. Those who were mentored well, mentor well. For me, that encapsulates the man, the myth, the legend, and my academic father, Dr. James D. Anderson. Doc, I gotta tell you this. I struggle with writing this introduction. How could I possibly articulate the influence your 50 year career and scholarship has had on American education, American law, and on those of us in attendance today in just a matter of a few minutes? How do you describe a scholar and mentor that introduces you to the academy, the archives in which we spend countless hours, travels to weddings, funerals, baby showers, graduations, ask how you're doing on a constant basis and actually waits for you to respond, shares a meal with your family, writes letters of recommendations, provides support needed, and always, always has time to listen. And on top of that, and on top of that is a prolific scholar. I can't do that, so I won't. Instead, I will share with you a few of your countless achievements and talk a bit about the impact that you have on the lives of many as evidenced by the members in this room. 
James E. Anderson grew up in Utah, Alabama. He attended Stillman College, a historically black college, and graduated with a BA in sociology. Growing up in segregated Alabama provided him with a foundation that many of us that grew up elsewhere in another generation could not begin to imagine. Jim's attendance at Stillman College provided him with a unique experience that was to stay in him as well as inform his research and his life. During his time at Stillman, professors introduced Jim to the intellectual tradition of scholars like W.E.B. Du Bois and Carter G. Woodson. Jim notes, Stillman was not just in an island in a sea of simmering white hostility and supremacy. It was a bastion of black pride and scholarship. After graduating from Stillman, he continued his studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and earned a master's degree. He then went on to complete his teaching practicum in Marshall High School in Chicago and then returned to the university to pursue his doctorate. Upon completing his PhD at Illinois, he took a position at Indiana University for a couple of years. And then Illinois recruited him back home, and the rest is a 50-year history of teaching, research, service, servant leadership, and mentorship. Dr. Anderson's scholarship broadly focuses on the history of US education, in which he pays keen attention to the intellectual history of the African-American community. His publications include work on the history of African-American education in the South, histories of public schools, institutional racism, the representation of blacks in secondary history high school texts, African-American school achievement, and desegregation. In a 2006 article titled, A Tale of Two Browns, Constitutional Equality and Unequal Education, Jim states, Brown be deemed promises of constitutional equality that have been rejected since the Declaration of Independence. Its legal significance and national scope and its meaning extends beyond the interest of any particular ethnicity, class, race, or gender. In vital respects, Brown achieved a hallowed place in American history and memory because it represents a watershed moment in the nation's quest for constitutional equality, a principle firmly articulated in the Declaration of Independence, yet virtually abandoned in the U.S. Constitution until the Reconstruction era. That's the type of work that Jim Anderson does. I would also argue that his scholarship, coupled with his leadership and mentorship, launched a new wave of historical research, ways of thinking, writing, and generations of scholars committed to the same quest for equity and justice. Now, a brief snapshot, very brief, of Dr. Anderson's accomplishments. His seminal book, The Education of Blacks in the South, won the American Educational Research Association Outstanding Book Award in 1990. From 2006 to 2016, Dr. Anderson served as senior editor of the History of Education Quarterly. In 2008, Dr. Anderson was elected to the National Academy of Education. In 2012, he was selected as a fellow for outstanding research by ARA and also received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Association, American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education. In 2013, he was selected as a Center for Advanced Study Professor of Education at the U of I. In 2019, he received the Impact Award from the Bruce D. Nesbitt African American Cultural Center at the University of Illinois. In 2020, ARA awarded him with the Presidential Citation, its highest award. And in that same year, Dr. Anderson was sworn into the Board of Trustees of Stillman College in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and inducted into the Stillman College Educator Hall of Fame. And in 2021, Dr. Anderson was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences one of the oldest honor societies in the nation. Dr. Anderson's <laughs> Dr. Anderson's reach extends beyond the academy. He has testified as an expert witness in several federal desegregation cases and in the University of Michigan affirmative action cases. He has served as an advisor for and participant in many documentaries. Doc, you have been recognized and will be recognized by many, including presidents, deans, commission members, representatives, and state legislatures, families, and friends. In our own small way, we, your students, are pleased to share this morning with you and a few of your very close friends and colleagues in the audience and online. It is important for us, for them, to know how much you have meant to us both personally and professionally. In many ways, this event is like a family reunion because so many have come back and traveled to be with you and to share the impact that your example has had on them. Your enduring living legacy is a testimony to what it means to foster leadership, ensure excellence, 
be community engaged, and to demonstrate the legitimacy of purpose and credibility in decision making. Dr. Anderson exemplifies intellectual acumen and humility in his daily walk, practice, and interaction with others. Dr. Anderson has achieved this legacy through his enthusiastic belief in an authentic support of excellence with equity, diversity with inclusion, freedom with responsibility, dialogue with respect, and transparency with accountability. He is a transformative leader. His knowledge, communication style, the genuine affection that he has for and shows towards others, and the commitment he has made to excellence at the University of Illinois, the profession, and the community leaves me inspired. In every place you have served, you have left things better organized, more focused, more just, and more human-centered. You are an indispensable visionary, leader, thinker, problem solver, and force for good in all places at all times. You have served, taught, and mentored forthrightly, authentically, enthusiastically, and humbly. Personally, I want to thank you, Doc, for your wisdom, your gift of time, and consistent example of what leadership and mentorship looks like both inside and outside the academy. In closing, I'm reminded of President Barack Obama, who wrote in a letter to Congressman John Lewis, because of you, which honored Mr. Lewis and all freedom fighters for making it possible for us to advance in life. I echo his, because of you. Because of you, Dr. Anderson, and all of your good trouble, our collective community is more knowledgeable, understands the assignment, and possesses a model of how to engage in the critical work needed for our mutual advancement. I would like to leave the audience with something that has stayed with me ever since I first met Dr. Anderson. His model of, and his charge to all of us, just do the work. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity, and thank you, Dr. Anderson, Ashe. His steadfast commitment to that principle has changed the course of education in our lifetime, and it has changed the course of our nation. Dr. Rabowski was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. He was 12 in 1963 when a visitor at church got his attention. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was discussing the next critical step in the black freedom struggle. Dr. Rabowski's parents made the difficult decision to allow him to participate in the Birmingham Children's March. He recalls that he went because it was important to do it. He remembers the moment Dr. King visited the children held in jail and told them that their actions would have an impact on children not yet born. Dr. Rabowski earned a degree in mathematics from Hampton Institute. Hampton Institute. Yay, Hampton! <laughs> and now MA in mathematics and a PhD in higher education administration from the University of Illinois. You will not be surprised to know that the lessons were not all about non-Euclidean geometry and real analysis, philosophy, and history of education. In graduate school, Dr. Rabowski also learned, quote, how lonely a student of color can be in a classroom. As an educational leader, he has worked mightily to change that. Upon graduation, Dr. Rabowski took a position at Coppin State University and then moved to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County as vice provost. He became president in 1992, launching a 30-year career as one of the nation's leading administrators in higher education. Next week, by the way, the History of Education Society is offering a plenary session on the history of African Americans in higher education that will feature Dr. Rabowski's place in that history. UMBC, UMBC was founded the same year as the Children's March in Birmingham as a regional university open to all students. Under Dr. Rabowski's leadership, it has gained an international reputation as one of the most successful schools and quite often the most successful in producing black graduates in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The two points are not unrelated. 
a school environment where students are expected to learn and learn to work together is a school where students thrive. UMBC's success is not limited to the natural sciences, engineering, and mathematics. Dr. Rabowski's message of questioning expectations, putting in the hard work, and staying focused permeates the campus to include students in the arts, humanities, and social sciences. The Meyerhoff Scholars Program at UMBC is a national model for supporting students in STEM. On campus, it has counterparts in the Sherman STEM Teachers Scholars Program and the Center for Women in Technology. As Dr. Rabowski explained in a 2018 article in The Atlantic, quote, we encourage broad participation and interaction among all groups, and in so doing, we are reflecting what we hope America will become. In this introduction, I've aimed to focus on the philosophy that has driven Dr. Rabowski's career. His work has garnered multiple personal awards and recognition for UMBC from the foremost academic, civic, and media organizations in the country. He has one of those resumes so impressive that one doesn't know where to start when it comes to listing achievements. I just want to name three. Inaugural Centennial Fellow at the American Council on Education. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute established the Freeman Rabowski Scholars Program to support the next generation of diverse faculty in STEM. Chair of the President's Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans, appointed by President Obama. Dr. Rabowski began early taking on hard work because it was important to do. In the context of the history of racism in the United States, there had to be more than idle hope that education could fuel significant change. Over the decades, he has taught countless students what can be accomplished with a strong sense of self, commitment to work in community, teachers' high expectations and involvement, and resources. The results speak for themselves. In his own words, Everybody thought it couldn't be done because it hadn't been done, and then we did it. In one of the videos that I found online where Dr. Anderson is speaking about the importance of history, he said, um, in many of the videos that are online where Dr. Anderson talks about the importance of history, he said simply, History as a dialogue is a dialogue between the past and the present, which not only informs our thinking and orientation, but the consciousness of the past and how that has shaped our present. Today's conversation between these two intellectual giants does just that, reflects on their past of growing up in Alabama, having a front row seat to the civil rights movement, being students at Illinois, which also encompassed their experiences as black students on a predominantly white campus during the 60s, and how their lived experiences shape their professional trajectory. Also, they will come, we will come to know as an audience about their unselfish commitment to equity and work with students. Both men are part of a larger historical narrative which has become their living legacy. So finally, the questions. Uh, Deirdre is going to start us off with the first question. We have a few in our pocket here, but we invite the audience to uh, send in questions. There's a QR code on the uh, program if you want to send them in electronically, or if you're like me, there, there's also paper and pen. And if you want to write a question on the paper um, and just wave it up, I guess Ashley will collect it and we'll get it up here and try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, I think. Can, can we give the two facilitators a round of applause for their excellent <laughs> And now for the conversation. The very first question we would like to ask the both of you. In what ways did your experiences growing up in Alabama prepare you for what you face as students and faculty at Illinois? You are the honorary. Please. Yes. Let me, you have always, I've always followed you. <laughs> uh, younger than me, I'm not sure you followed me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you certainly cut your own path from the beginning. Um, probably in a number of ways. I, 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 would, I would say my experience in high school as well as Stillman College. Um, being surrounded by a lot of brilliant students. Can you put the mic up a little bit? Okay. This will be better. 
That's the college president telling him to do that. I like that. <laughs> Saying he's a college president. Oh, he said he's a college School of Education, and uh, during the last minute preparation, and there was this white couple sitting not too far from me, and I heard the man say to the woman, uh, I'm going to go over and talk to the colored boy. <laughs> no, no, this is the height of the black power movement. Like <laughs> 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 colored boy. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes over, very nice man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very good. He said, you know. You're doing the right thing. I had three sons, and they studied, they burned the midnight on all, and they all graduated from college. If you keep doing that, <laughs> you will graduate from college. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, uh, well, thank you, but I'm a professor at Indian University. <laughs> he didn't say another word. <laughs> He went back over to his wife and he said, the colored boy saves you the professor. <laughs> <laughs> so he saves you the president. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, even coming to Illinois, uh, it was an environment I'd never been in before, growing up in Alabama. Yeah, I grew up in Jim Crow, Alabama, and uh, this place was different in so many ways, not to mention the climate and the weather, but just a very, very fundamentally different environment. But I, I kind of had a sense of who I was, and that's what I got uh, from a child, from high school, from still in college. So I came with a sense of, you know, this notion from whence you come. And that's the thing that served me best because you bounce back and forth um, trying to figure out what the values are, what the culture is. And I don't know, my, my first day in the College of Education, Rupert Evans was the dean at the time. And he saw me in the hall and he said, um, hey, why don't you come to my office and we talk to you. And, I walked in and he says, I'm the dean of the college. I'm thinking, why the dean? <laughs> talking to me, and he said, uh, where are you from? I said, I'm from Alabama, and um, I'm in graduate school here, and then he proceeded to ask me about uh, friendship. He said, I bet where you came from, a friend is a friend always, and I was like, yeah, he's my friend today, he's my friend. And he says, well, here, you're going to have to learn the difference between a friend and an ally. Why is the dean talking to me about this? <laughs> so now I'm quiet because I don't know where he's going with this. And so he said, remember, an ally is a person who will stick with you as long as you can help them to get where they're going. And when that's no longer the case, they separate. <laughs> where a friend is a friend. And I thought, yeah, that's my background. That's my culture. It's where someone is your friend. That's always your friend, someone you support. Um, I don't know that I've had any ally before, but he was kind of telling me about a different culture and how people will uh, be with you, and you might think of them as a close friend because of the way that they behave and support you, but something could change, and all of a sudden they're saying bye. And I thought I was uh, prepared for a place like this because. I just knew my teachers in elementary and high school, uh, my mentors are still in college, they just prepared me to whatever the challenge was to take it on. Okay. And the students around me, um, 
one thing that I was just learning, uh, I didn't I didn't have that as feeling when I arrived. Um, I had just graduated at 17 from high school. I was a valedictorian. I walked into Stillman uh, as a part of the freshman class. I wasn't overconfident, but I was feeling pretty good about myself. <laughs> Then all these students came in from Birmingham. <laughs> Graduates of Parker High and Bowman High. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> and I remember saying, you know, some valedictorians are more equal than others. <laughs> <laughs> One of my classmates at the end of the first semester, and that was something that started to reshape uh, my thinking about academics, about my career, about just um, uh, advance. Mm -hmm. So this was in the first semester. I got my grades. I made the dean's list. Got one. I'm feeling pretty good about myself now. So I'm walking across campus. I saw her, and she's crying. And I'm thinking, oh my god, she's going to <laughs> So I went over to console her. I said, What's wrong? She said, I got a B. <laughs> so I thought that was the only good grade she got. Uh, oh. So I kind of said, well, maybe I shouldn't ask, but I'll ask anyway. I said, well, what were your other grades? It was almost like I poured a bucket of cold water. She snapped to attention and said, hey, the cold water. <laughs> <laughs> She's crying. So she got one B. Well, what I was learning from my classmates are still from different places across the state of Alabama, that they were about excelling. They weren't about just making the dean's list or passing or making the grade. It's like, if you're gonna be keeping up with us, you need to be on a different track and think of it in different ways. So I thought, I need to, I need to get my game together here. <laughs> and, but competing with them, Freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year, um, just you know, just keeping up and, and, and being competitive, not in a in a negative way, mm -hmm. but in a very friendly way, by saying, you know, I respect what you're doing and you respect me, and I'm going to do better because of my admiration for you and my appreciation for the way you're going about things. And I thought that helped me more than anything coming into an environment like this because it was a challenge coming yes. here. Uh, my first year was not a good year. In fact, I planned to leave at the end of my first year. I was in McKinley for eight days uh, because uh, I didn't, uh, I never won a hat or gloves or anything like that. <laughs> not that it's changed. My friend Bill Trenton bought me two hats in the last two or three years. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, see me here. Yeah, I bought you a hat. <laughs> but it wasn't, a, it, it, was a, it was a challenging year. But when things uh, didn't go as well, I had that um, fortitude that I got from elementary high school from Stillman College. Um, and a lot of it goes from the students that were around me uh, who inspired me. I mean, I had mentors and teachers, but I don't think anything inspires you more like the, the fellow students. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, so I'll stop there. Yes. Let me start by saying that I am here because of my great admiration for Jim Anderson. He is such a giant in this world. Give him another round. <laughs> and I've been thinking about this conversation for some time. Uh, I, I will, just to answer your question though, to the facilitators, I, I grew up in the big city, you heard him say it. He's from the country. You talk the country. Let me just be very clear about that. We always say we were Alabama boys. There's Alabama and there's Alabama. I'm from what they call the ham, Birmingham. He thought we were all that in Birmingham. And, I, and I, my, my third book on uh, Holding Fast to Dreams is on growing up in middle class Birmingham. I was blessed to have parents who were teachers. And I grew up with everybody from Angela Davis, was three or four years younger. Her mother taught me. My mama taught her and her sisters and her brothers in my class. To somebody two or three years younger, Connie Rice. Her dad was my high school counselor. And it, we were blessed in that way. We really were. Alan Powell, whose uncle was my principal. So it was middle class Birmingham. 
But we knew we were considered second class. And the church was at the center, Reverend Underwood, the center of everything. We were always in church. We were learning in church. Uh, and it was in that experience that I learned from Dr. King, a friend of the families, and went and spent that time in jail. And the significance is that in our black community, everybody was black. The doctor, the lawyer, the preacher, the teachers, everybody. And they kept saying to us, don't you dare let anyone else define who you are. Don't allow yourself to be a victim. And that experience was powerful to us. And so at age 12, in addition to having that experience in jail, I watched the governor of my state stand in the door of the, the most prestigious university, the University of Alabama, and say, no way are people looking like this coming in here with all the national cameras. And, and I'll never forget my mother saying, that's his problem. Don't you dare allow him to define who you are. And that was that kind of rich background. Brother Harris appreciates this, that historical perspective. And here's what I would tell you. So my parents sent me and my cousin up to New England to go to school in the summers to see what the difference would be, because we had not been in classes twice. And we saw two things. Number one, nobody was mean to us. We were just invisible. Nobody would speak to me. Not even the teachers. I would raise my hands. Nobody would look right. And I, we, Mama was an English teacher, so I read the Invisible Man, and I knew what it felt to be invisible. But the education, the education was superb, superior to what we were getting in, in math, in literature. So my folks were always trying to supplement. When I went to, and I, I did graduate from college early, I was to go to Morehouse at 14. At the last minute, they kept me back, and I went to the local college, my house, while studied there while I was and went to Hampton at 15. And there I saw that kids from the North had had a superior education. Um, and those from the islands and from African countries had that very rich British education. But just one story, I thought I still thought I was the smartest kid in the room. <laughs> and we got the first calculus test back. And all of a sudden, the professor said, um, I'm going to call the names in descending order of those who got an A. So I'm ready to get up and get my, my correct. <laughs> and I'm ready. And she calls the first name, one mine. Mm. Second name, one mine. She got to number eight. And she finally said, what's that name? Rabowski? How Rabowski or something? I got a barely an A minus. I had tears coming. It was the first time I realized I was far from the smartest kid in the room. All right. And all of a sudden she said, Colby, you can come get your paper. A girl gets up. We called them boys and girls then. She was as cute as she could be, and I holler out, I'm going to marry her one day. And I did. I went to her that, and I did. And she came here to grad school with me. Jackie came here. And that was our story there. And so that, that's the Alabama experience. And, all right, that's the Alabama experience. Ended with my marriage. And she and I have been married 52 years. Give her a round of applause. graduate school period, I wonder if you could speak a bit about some of the salient issues students faced at that time and sure. how you all responded. Sure, sure. I'll start that one because first of all, I always looked at Jim. Jim was working on his dissertation. I remember that. And he was kind enough to share with me the experiences and I was so fascinated that he was studying Southern education, the education of blacks in the South. And we were both Alabama boys and uh, my mom had gone to Tuskegee and Booker Washington was very special to us. And much of what had been written about Washington was so condescending. While we were very appreciative of the talent of the 10th and you boys, we knew what Booker Washington had done for so many families, so many families in the South. Uh, and Jim had an understanding of those challenges, that it's always complicated, that it's not simple. And I'll never forget just thinking, we all said we want to be him. See, there was some one, and I, I mean, you know, uh, you talk to Trent, the mirrors are here, fellow presidents of the mirrors, Paul, and others. Uh, but, but the Boxdales were the standard. Oh, yeah. yeah. Richard and Mildred, they were already professors and deans. And give the Boxdales a round of applause, please. <laughs> there is, so there was that level, and, and Dick, Richard was uh, associate dean of the grad school at the time, but here, and, and Mildred worked in LAS. But, 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 Jim was what was possible. He was still working towards his PhD that last period. 
and doing so well and so cerebral and so humble and kind to us, right? Not arrogant. And that was all very enriching, it really was. But what I will tell you is that my first year, the chair of the department said, you're going to be a novelty here in math. So be ready for that. My professor from Hampton, my beloved Hampton, where they did teach me to prepare for a cold world. They taught me to be special. That's why I say, and when I go to Hampton, I kiss the ground. It was just that special. And I'll never forget, in the first two classes, in set theory and in topology, Professor walks into class, it's all men, uh, all white, and me. And each time the professor came in and he looked and he saw me and he said, oh, this is set theory. And everybody smirks. Because he thought I wasn't supposed to be there. You know, all right. And so the second time the professor in topology comes in, he gets ready to say something. I said, this is topology, right? In other words, I'm supposed to be here, all right? I'm supposed to be here. And I'll never forget that sense from others that I wasn't supposed to be there. And when I asked them about studying with them, they always said, oh, we don't, we don't study together. And I'd get to the library, and they'd be there studying. All right? And so what I would do, literally, is go to the professor and say, I don't understand. I, really, am I, a prof I would call my professor, Geraldine Garden, who would go in here to grad school, and say, what do I do? She said, you go to that professor, and you tell him you don't understand. And I did just that. And uh, the professors were reasonable with me and, and wanted to understand more about my background. I tell you that, though, I'll never forget. Every time I would ask a question, though, the professor would go, but it wasn't about me. It wasn't about me. Anytime somebody else asked a question. In other words, you don't get that? Because the, the mindset in STEM is if you've got to ask too many questions, you probably shouldn't be here. That's just, you know, my TED talk talks about just that, the fact that we weed out most kids. And so at one point, uh, the professor said to me, I said, I see how you got to step four, because everything is a proof in, in algebra, algebra. I, but I don't see how you get all the way to step seven. And isn't it obvious? And everybody kind of giggles, right? The second time I asked, I wanted to say, sucker, if it was obvious, I wouldn't ask the question, <laughs> right? But you couldn't say that as a little grad student, right? <laughs> So what I would do, because my, my Alabama folks, my minister, my professor in heaven said, don't you let them define, you go there and say, no, it isn't obvious to me. So I would go to the office and say, I need help. I need help. So we got the first midterm back in the, in the algebra, algebra course, the algebra, algebra and uh, I got an A minus, and I'll never forget, I saw my, these white boys on my side, and they got C's. So I held up here, I said, I guess it was obvious. So <laughs> <laughs> Final point, he put on my paper, you did surprisingly well. I went up to him afterwards, but I told him, Mama's in English, he said, why the adverb? <laughs> he turns red. You know, black folks don't turn red, all right? He turns red, and he says, ah, oh, it's because you're from a small school. He didn't know what school I was from. He just didn't expect me to do it. But at the end of the semester, to his credit, he said, you know, I lied to you. I was surprised because I never had a black in the class. And he said, you taught me something today. So very reasonable. That's my story. Yeah, from Illinois changed very quickly uh, while I was here. Uh, I came in 66, fall oh, 66, right out of undergraduate. Um, and there were very, very few black students on campus and even few graduate students. Um, I knew a couple of people, so uh, usually in a class where I was the only one, um, I remember taking a class in European intellectual history. Great professor, I think, one of the greatest teachers I've ever had. He could take a class of 350 and you just felt like you were in there by yourself. Mm -hmm. Great. But one day I just felt like not going. So I didn't go. And then I was on the quad, coming out of the union. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you cut class. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. And then he smiled and he says, I know it's unfair, but you're the only black student. <laughs> so when you're not there, it's quite. And yeah. that's the way it was. Uh, but then two years later, in 68, we had the 500 program. Yeah. And most people think about it, that whole movement is just undergraduates. But by that time, because I eventually became chairman of the Black Graduate Recruitment Committee. Mm -hmm. And we were recruiting a lot more 
black graduate students, particularly from HBCUs. Mm -hmm. And that population was changing very rapidly. So by 68, this was a very different place. Mm -hmm. um, and those who were here when I arrived, in one of the games they would play, how long can you be on the quad before you see another black student? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And they, I was out there six hours. Uh -huh. <laughs> Stop worrying. <laughs> you know. But it was just sort of, uh, you know, it, it just was a testimony to how few black students that were on yeah. this campus, how yeah. few students come. In fact, yes. um, I knew at the time that if you did the combined representation of Native American students, Asian American students, Latino, Latinx students, and black students on this campus when I arrived, it was less than 2%. Uh -huh. And this place started to change very rapidly. People forget it was always one of the first universities to make that change. Michigan, with this Black Action Movement, BAM movement, didn't happen until uh, 1970. Uh, so Illinois, making that move in 68, had changed higher education in ways that are still under, not fully appreciated by historians of higher education. Other places would fall in the Big Ten, yes, and then across the country. But here, you were already in a different context. That's why you had things like uh, one of the first black student association, uh, even the founder of the Black Chorus in 1968, which is still a treasure here, uh, the Black Culture Center. We were able to do things because we had numbers. And you learn very quickly, if you don't have numbers, you can't do anything. Uh, so it was changing very rapidly. It was feeling very different. I have to say that in the College of Education, I had I was fortunate to have some very good mentors. There were no black faculty in the College of Education. There were only two on campus, uh, Professor Quick in the law school, Professor Eubanks in the College of Engineering. Yes. Yes. There was another professor in physics who stayed for like one year, two uh -huh. years, uh -huh. and then he left. He was a uh, faculty advisor to the uh, Black Student Association. But within the College of Education, and I remember I had, I had actually planned my way out of here. It wasn't, it wasn't the way I was taught or raised to quit. But anyway, after the end of the first semester, I got a call. I was on an NDEA fellowship, and I got a call from the Department of Education saying, look, we understand that you're from the Black Belt of Alabama. <laughs> How do you know that? <laughs> so, at that time, we would be like, what kind of surveillance is going on? <laughs> he said, no, we have your fellowship application and everything. And he said, we want you to go back. Because uh, we're bringing in a lot of VISTA volunteers. And we need someone who understands what it's like to live there. Like, well, who are you bringing in? Well, they were bringing in students from Harvard, from Berkeley, from UC, all over the country. None of them had ever been south. And I realized, like, I was supposed to tell them what to do and what not to do, sure. what can get you in trouble, what can get sure. you in trouble. Sure. So I thought, ah, I got my plan out of here now. Um, I went to Miles College. Yeah. That summer, uh, Arrington, who was later mayor of Birmingham, yeah. he was the vice president of yeah. Miles at the time. Yeah. So I went yeah. to Miles College uh, to teach adult education. Uh -huh. And I thought, I get to Alabama, I'll get a job, and I won't come back. Here. I was gone. It was a good year. So I was there uh, in Fairfield, Alabama, uh, which is right in Birmingham, near Birmingham. And one day the phone rang, and it was my faculty in the College of Education. And they was like, hey, yeah, I heard from you. How are you doing? How's the, how's the uh, Vista volunteer thing going? And they said, we like the fact that you have this field experiment. Because they were saying, you fresh out of undergraduate, you never done anything, never had a job. For, uh, I've had jobs, but not the kind that uh, you could put on your resume. <laughs> 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 you can't put chopping cotton on your resume. <laughs> I've done that. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and so they said, well, we just want you to know what we're planning for you. So we plan for you to do your practice teaching at Marshall High School in Chicago. Mm -hmm. That's already set, and we had other plans for you, and so we just waited on you to come back. And I say, well, you know, I was actually thinking about just staying home. And he said, um, you know, we didn't admit you to the University of Illinois for you to leave. 
or wash out or anything like that. I said, oh, he said, do you know why we admitted you here? I'm like, actually, I don't. Right. <laughs> you know? right, right. And he said, we admitted you to become an outstanding alum of this university and to represent us. Mm -hmm. And so we want you back. And it's because of that call and their saying, we got plans for you. I, and at that time, I was not in district education. I was in social studies education in the Department of what is now curriculum instruction in a secondary education. Mm -hmm. I was planning to become a social studies teacher. Mm -hmm. And they had all these plans. And I thought, maybe I should go back. Because they have this kind of care, this kind of interest. If they had not called me, mm -hmm. I would have gotten a job in Alabama, and I would not have come back. Yes. But yes. I must give credit to you know Professor Cox and Professor Dula Erickson. They've all retired, and yes. some uh, passed on since then. But I was in a situation which was not common across campus. Yes. But I was in a situation where they were really concerned, and then when I went <clears throat> after completed my master's degree going into the PhD in District of Education, because uh, you shared my professors, Bills and Carrie, they were extremely supportive. Yes. And, um, so I found myself in a different context, yes. uh, both in terms of the students on campus, but I had a new appreciation for the faculty who were, who had, you know, who, who not just wanted me to come back, but yes. as they said, we want you to become an outstanding alum of this university. Yes. I had not heard that before, yeah. but hearing that, and I say that because um, a lot of times students of color don't hear that. They can travel to this whole university, and I'll end uh, with the story. Um, actually, I heard it from Mildred Briggs, former dean of the College of Education, and she told me about this one undergrad who was doing an independent study with her. And she was a very bright student. She'd always done good work she had in class before. But on this paper, she turned it in and Milton gave it back to him by saying, no, uh, this is not good enough. This is not your, you better than this. And she left. And so all of a sudden, she came back, literally in tears standing there. And she said, I've been in this university four years and no one has ever told me that I was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And that could happen to students of color in a place like this and across the country. That even when you're doing well, no one says things like, and for them to say, we want you to become an outstanding alum of this university, and it spoke volumes to me and made all the difference in my coming back. Um, and, uh, and that's why I came back. It's powerful. It's about just, just one comment about that. You know, you have the environment, the culture, and I write a lot about culture change in my book. Uh, you're going to have people who may not see you. So I tell students, but you look for those who do see you, who can make a difference. There was a, a French mathematician who was very, very intrigued by me, but very authentic and saying, I don't know about black people in America. And we would have conversations. There was only one woman in mathematics out of 100 faculty. She was not tenure track, PhD, but she said, I know what you're going through. Mm -hmm. It made a difference. And then in higher education, I'll never forget, um, it really was joy and fly. Yeah. Lady Joy Fly, who told me one that she says, You're going to be a college. In fact, she even wrote it. I promise you, you're going to be a college president. Before, it was powerful that mm -hmm. she did that. And then others at the university, uh, and always, and I would, some people are here from Upward Bound. Upward Bound taught me so much about the teaching and learning process and teaching kids to have a sense of self. With a lot of kids who were in Upward Bound, who would say to me when I'm saying they could do well in chemistry, yeah, but, but I got the, the son of the chair of the chemistry department in my class. How am I supposed to do as well as him? Mm -hmm. You know, when my dad works on the yard at his house, right? And, and so it was a, a lesson for me. Um, and Greta, Greta Hogan, yeah. was powerful, powerful in, in her emphasis on language skills and thinking skills for everybody. And I was learning in that process. So my point is that, while I've said to people, it was not the most positive experience. I'd look and see one light brown skin face in a sea of other people. They'd be my new wife, and I'd wave to way in the crowd. Hey, hey, we're in the, we're in the wasteland somehow. Hey. But as time went on, we, we, got, we had more and more feelings. And most important, though, let's say this about the university. 
It's a big deal to have a dean, a black dean of education, and a black chancellor of this campus. That's a big deal. That's and to produce this work. Very important to Thank you both. Um, our next question is, do you think about your collective work, which challenges widely held historical and contemporary assumptions about black education? <coughs> Can you talk about how you navigate your responses to your work? Stop. Go ahead, because I'm going to get some coffee while you go. <laughs> um, I actually didn't, I didn't read any of the responses. <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> and, and it's like people will say, well, you know, I saw you in this documentary. I don't ever make it a documentary, but I never watched it ever. Um, in part because, like, when I would hear my own voice, I'm like, is that me? <laughs> it had that strangeness about it. But I did, I, I, I felt this way about it. I felt like I had, it, had every opportunity in the world to put my best foot forward. And when I wrote the last line, I was, I was done with it. People often, like today, they would read a quote, and I was like, did I actually say that? <laughs> <laughs> I've never read it. <laughs> it's like, you learn so much while you're doing it that you're the one person that knows all of its limitations and how much more more improved it could have been as you go through it. And, uh, and so I never had any exchanges about responses. I think there was a time at ARA when I responded to 25th anniversary or something like that. But I, did, I, I, just, I was like on to the next thing. You, you know, you've done this. Um, and um, <laughs> we'll tell this story though because um, I did not tell my mother that I was writing this book because I know I didn't want to be worried about uh -huh. me struggling writing the book. I wasn't really struggling, but I just didn't want her to be worried, period. She's back then in Alabama, so uh -huh. all her imagination could be what I'm going to do here. Yeah. So somebody called and told her, and she would do that. She, she, she knows me well enough to know that I can't count on him to tell me what he's doing. So I, wherever he goes, I need to find someone else I can call. <laughs> and she, she would find that person. Because one time I was at home and the knock on the door with the police. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God. So I opened it and I said, so, is there anything wrong? He said, that's what we need to find out. Your mother called. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Mommy, it's not a good practice to be calling the police <laughs> on, on me. I'll call more. Break it <laughs> so she called when she found out. She said, Are you, are you writing a book? I said, Yeah, I, I am. She, I couldn't lie then. So the next question was, Well, how long is this book? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think if I said like 15 pages, she would have been okay. Okay, uh huh, uh huh. I said, I think it's going to be 300 some pages, and it was complete silence. <laughs> Just complete silence. And I said, Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know whether it was disbelief or what, but anyway, I finished and I sent her a copy. And by the time I got home, she read it from cover to cover. And she had one response. You should have talked to me before writing. <laughs> 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 so she was right because I was writing about the experience that was her lived experience. Yes, yes. She had been through all of that yes. and so forth. And uh, I said, uh, 
oh, I didn't want to worry you. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> and but that's that was, you know, I, I didn't have much of an interaction with people who write. No, a lot of book reviews written. I I did not. I did decided I wouldn't read them. Um, I'll be okay with them, whatever they say, because. I have a chance to put my best foot forward, and once I, no restrictions whatsoever, and I've done that, and okay, my part I play, the rest is up to you. And I think people should feel that way about their scholarship. Don't take it personal. If you're criticizing the book, you're criticizing the book. You're not criticizing me. Okay. Um, I'm on to something else in the first place. Um, you're supposed to be anybody's book and do a critical appraisal. It's not that you criticize it me. And that's the attitude that I took. And so uh, so I just thought, there it is. I didn't know what was going to happen to the book, by the way. I just thought it was, and this is the last thing I'll say, because you know how you're writing something, particular history. And I got to the point, I remember my department chair at the time, Plants Carrier, one day, he says, how's the book coming? I said, oh, I'm moving on to something else. Everybody already knows this. You know, you write and you keep going, you keep finding things that seem like, well, everybody knows this. He said, no, you're ready to publish that because you don't know the one that knows all of that. Because I decided just to go and do something else that was more exciting than you. I wasn't going to finish the book. Wow. And he said, you need to finish that. And, he, and, and, and I did. But by the time that I finished, I was like relieved to get it off my shoulders. You know, I've done that, it's done, let me move on to something else. And so I didn't really get into what was the follow-up, what was the criticism. Um, and I would meet people and they would talk about it and it's almost like they were talking about somebody else, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And I could tell people who didn't like it, uh, they would say, man, that's one hell of a bibliography. I did spend a lot of time on the bibliography. I get the point. <laughs> you don't really want to talk about the book because there are a lot of things in there that rub you the wrong way. Well, I read my books that rub me the wrong way as well. But, um, I respect the authors. You know what they go through, how much right. blood, sweat, and tears they put into it. Right. Um, and so, uh, I'll go ahead and let it go. So, you know, when I think about responses to the work, the, all the work that, that I did, the books, the articles, reflected the work my colleagues and I were accomplishing, uh, particularly over this past 30 some years at UBC. I had this notion with my colleagues that we could create an environment that was as nurturing in that predominantly white setting as Hampton had been for me. And there were colleagues from HBCUs, colleagues from large research universities that said, no, that, that's not going to happen. They are different animals. They're just different animals. And, and I will say there's something I said yesterday about here. When you get to the Big Ten universities, there's much more emphasis on the graduate students than the undergraduate students. Undergraduate students pay the bills. But the emphasis, just being honest, really is on the grad students. Liberal arts colleges are for undergraduates. And you can get a good undergrad education here, but the, the emphasis, and I really was interested in creating an environment that reflects what Jim Collins said in Good to Great, the genius of the and versus the tyranny of the or. How do we, continue to build a research, be a research one, and yet have that feel of a liberal arts college? And how do we create an environment where we're not going to be big in sports as a rule? We're going to be nerdy. Because when we think of, when we think of Big Ten, what's the first thing you think about? Even though you got Nobel Prize, what did you think about football and basketball? Uh, when you think of Carnegie Mellon, you think about brain power. You see? So we wanted to create that environment that was nerdy. Um, that and that was focused on inclusive excellence. More African Americans, Latinos, and others doing well. And the biggest problem, though, the biggest challenge was people said it was too soon to try to think about large numbers of blacks excelling in science. All of my scientific friends said it's going to take several generations. 
before we can see. I could not find one university in America 35 years ago that had produced 15 black kids a year in all the science and engineering areas who only got PhDs. And the places that were producing stuff were the, the HBCUs, your Norma Howard and Hampton, Morehouse and Spelman, Xavier, um, and as time went on, North Carolina A&T and one or two more, Morgan, Florida and But the point is that now today, still, the fact is that in the top 10 for producing natural science and engineering, we're the only campus that is not an HBCU that produces large numbers of bachelor's African Americans. In fact, we're the number one producer of African Americans who want to get PhDs in natural sciences and engineering in America. Give us a big round of applause. So the research, and I want to give credit to another professor in education, Maurice Taksuoka, uh, was in statistics, was in ed psych and psych. And uh, he loved the fact that I had a theoretical background with the masters in, in math. And uh, I fell in love with this, this this approach to statistics. And it gave me a chance to talk to somebody. As I said yesterday, you can't talk about group theory and ring theory. Most people think you're crazy. But when, when I was able to apply the quantitative work to real problems, all of a sudden I had more people in the social sciences to talk with. And he was kind enough to let me teach some of his classes. And that, that, so that was always, I was an evaluation staff person within higher ed. And that was always great for me. But it also taught me one important lesson throughout my career as a leader. Bring the evaluation, qualitative and quantitative, into the work from the beginning. You don't wait until you finish and say, let's evaluate. Let's think about what you have in, in mind at the end and go from there. Bear, give me a round of applause for that and evaluation because we need more of that. We need more of that evaluation work. I, but, but I tell you that because the biggest problem was that most people in the scientific community just think it, well, what they think was possible to produce large numbers of blacks at the undergrad level in a predominantly white setting. And that, that was the real challenge. And that's what that work of ours has focused on, all the way to this last book on the Empower University. Most significant, just two examples, and one I told yesterday from Illinois, the fact that the woman who had worked to take care of Clarence Shell and tell him what to do, Elvin Putnam Underwood, who had been the administrator since, and then went on through the doctoral program in law school and medicine and all of that, her grandson, and I taught her kids in Upper Bound, Right? And then her grandson from Atlanta came up, and one of my students just a year ago got the prestigious Rhodes Fellowship. And they're Rhodes Scholars and Rhodes Scholars. But wait, this is a Rhodes Scholar with a background in math and economics. He's doing a PhD at Oxford in quantitative economics, a graduate. I mean, coming a, a product of a product. Give him a round of applause for that. It's a big deal. Big deal. Big deal. And the final example, and this is our proof from all the evaluation work we did. Final example is if you took the Moderna vaccine, one of my Mount House scholars, first black woman in the world to create a vaccine, now in the faculty in Harvard, from a little country town in North Carolina. Big round of applause for her. So that's our response. We've shown it can be done. And we keep writing about that, right? And trying to challenge universities like Illinois, that has, by the way, made progress in the life sciences. They're in the top 15 for blacks going on to get PhDs. I said this yesterday and I'll say it today, there's still the challenge. You do better than Michigan in black students, but it's all about mediocrity because there are only six or seven percent here. I can go on this campus and not see anybody black. I see Hispanics and I'm glad I do. I see Asians and I'm glad I do. But I said, and I know everybody's working on it, but we should not forget, given the population in the state of Illinois that, need to, that we need to see more black undergraduates doing well in this campus. But a number of questions online and on the cards are about um, mentoring and guidance. And so, um, try to pose it this way: Many of your students aspire to emulate your work in mentoring and guidance uh, to undergraduate and graduate students. Um, what would you offer as advice, I guess, for those who are continuing to engage today's students? Just a compliment to Jim. Wherever I go in this country, somebody will say I'm one of Jim's. I'm one of docs. Wherever I go in this country, I'm one of docs. Wherever I go, you talk about, and I heard, and I, I have such respect for our chancellor here now, and I've known him for years. He said something about don't ever underestimate what one person can do. 
If you've been touched by the life of, of Jim and the mentoring of Jim Anderson, stand up now. Let me see who you are. Anybody with that? Big round of applause. <laughs> And I mean, they, so my only point is this. I mean, if we had to use three words, uh, it would be, be like Doc. Be like Jim. That, 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 that would be the three words. And it's that humility on the one side, and on the other side, the one thing I say to young faculty, whether they're in the social sciences, educational sciences, you want to help other students, uh, students. But when you're in that faculty position, you know you've got to get that research done. Because if you don't get the research done, you're not going to be there. So you got to take the long view. And so uh, because we tend to be accessible women, people of color, the fact is everybody will want to tell you all their problems. you got to get them to somebody whose job it is to be the counselor or the advisor so you can get that research done. Now, for mine, I'm always saying bring some of those kids into your lab. But I'm saying the one piece of advice that we saw from Jim even here, he was serious about that research. It was his life. You know, and that, that was focused on the history of South with, a, with an emphasis on strength-based strength-based. It was not about deficiency. It was about what we were able to do and why. And of all the things I can say, the emphasis on literacy, because right now we see that so many children, black children, Hispanic children, poor white children, cannot read. And I mean, you get down from the policy just to that fundamental point. So in understanding the history and the struggles people had in, in working on that issue, it can be inspiring in helping others know this is why you do what you do. So you can't produce people like this. Uh, it, 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 mentoring has always been something that's deeply personal for mm -hmm. me because um, I've not told the story. I think I did tell it to Jarvis Gibbons there. Stand up, Jarvis. So, uh, Jarvis is a historian of education. But <laughs> he has a new book coming out called School Clothes, and he, he talked but. Um, I had no dreams of going to college, none whatsoever. Um, and I recall that in my brother's class, he was one year ahead of me, that nobody in his graduating class went to college. Wow. Not a single person. And so they all left and went to Detroit and New York and other places to get a job. Uh -huh. And I remember. One of the questions that teachers would ask, I wanted to just yell and say, leave me alone. They used to do these aspiration studies. What are you going to be when you grow up? And I wanted to say, how could I possibly know? Yeah. And, and how can I get you to just leave me alone and quit asking me? Because I don't have these dreams or imaginations. I know what everybody else has done around me, from my community, from families. Mm -hmm. And finally it occurred to me that because in you know, Sunday school, Jesus was a carpenter, and that was good. So I was, I'm going to be a carpenter. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was like, what, what you got to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, and I was still doing well. As I said earlier, I graduated from Dr. Detroit. I was doing well. But Valedictorian before me didn't go to college. Wow. So, and so I had um, was getting ready for commencement. In fact, we were in line for commencement, and my only concern was giving the valedictorian speech. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to do it from memory then, mm -hmm. no notes, you got to do it from memory. And the whole community is there, and they're like, we're going to see if you're educated. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm nervous about this. And then my um, homeroom teacher, um, asked Professor Herman Hughes later in his life, he became a ma professor of mathematics at Michigan State University. Oh. But he was my homeroom teacher then, math teacher. And he called me out of the line. We were getting ready to go in. And he said, uh, I need to talk to you, and that scared me to death. Because mm -hmm. when I went to high school, when they pulled you out of line, <laughs> yeah, that's our problem. Yeah, you pulled out good. <laughs> and so I went to his office to talk to the to the homeroom, which was right near the auditorium. And he said, um, 
I need to tell you that before you give your address, they're going to announce that you have a scholarship to Stillman College. Wow. Wow. I was like, what? <laughs> And he had gone to Stillman. He was a graduate of Stillman. Mm. He had gone there and talked to the dean and says, there's a young man you should take a chance on. Mm. And so I had a handwritten letter mm. that I had a scholarship mm. to Stillman College. Ah. And he says, I don't want you to forget this address. <laughs> um, and he says, they got to announce it before. Well, I was only concerned about the, or about the bell, but they told me they couldn't turn the bell off. And so they, when the bell was sounding, you're supposed to stop and then continue. I thought that was my only concern. <laughs> and that's when I found out that I was going to college on the day of my graduation. Wow. But I also knew that what he had done, without even telling me that he'd gone up there and made the case for me. I yes. had not even applied to school. Yes, yes. He had a letter from the dean yeah. and then helped me fill out the application later. Yeah. And it made the difference for me heading north to New Jersey where my brother was trying to get a job in the factory as opposed to going to college. And it was mentoring, all about mentoring. Um, and I just felt throughout my career that there was no way I could repay him. Mm -hmm. But I could do a little bit here and there. Pay it more. Pay it more. more. Can I try my best? Excellent. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We have a question from the audience that asks, in this anti-intellectual anti -intellectual moment that we are currently in, how do we as educators meet this moment? And the second part of that is, how specifically do we combat the reign of ignorance over critical thinking? Yes. Yeah. It's an excellent, excellent question. There are several things I would say. Number one, um, seeking the truth as a theme in our lives. Seeking the truth at a time when the truth and evidence are not at the center of what we do. That it's far more about just winning the argument, but seeking the truth. I, and I also want to add to that something that's significant for today, the importance of history. The importance of history. When we think about Professor Anderson's work in that late 19th century, first of all, the 20th century, having done things since then with this book, and then the history of education, the, the, the idea of history, but also the idea of diversity of backgrounds within the African American community, from a small town, from the city. Uh, I look at Dr. Ward that you all stole from the National Science Foundation, and I hated it until I heard she was coming here. But I, I, the book that's written on desegregation in Atlanta, when she integrated that, that school, that, that very prestigious white school, and they went on to Princeton and Stanford. That's another part of the history of African Americans. So we've got all these different types, and the, the point I would make is we should take pride in that history, that we have seen families struggle through Upward Bound and through other programs at EOP here, and to transform lives of so many people, and what we have to do is to keep thinking about the importance of ideas, and to be inspired by how far we have come in spite of how far we still have to go. We could not, Jim and I can talk about how bad things were, and in some cases they may be as bad, in other ways they're not as bad. It just depends. We've got to put it in perspective. And so what I would suggest is that we continue to show through our example that we are working to seek the truth. And there's a saying I tell my students, those the gods wish to destroy, they first make angry. If you get angry, you'll say things you embarrass about the next day. That we have to be willing to listen to different perspectives and breathe deeply and analyze what people are saying and put this time right now in the future of democracy. And, but it's our actions that will have a big impact on what the next generation will think. Yeah, I think one uh, uh, 
Much of that intellectualism and, and, and disinformation is just a fundamental part of American history. It's been there with us. The evangelical movements of the 19th century yes. and others, and uh, Jim Jones movement or David Koresh movement, all kinds of movements like that, they feed on fear yeah. to begin with. Yes. I mean, the you need this information when you're afraid. Yes. Because what else can actually support beliefs? Yeah. I, mean, the, I mean, our teachers emphasize this in elementary school. That's why they had us to read Chicken Little. Yeah. yeah. You know, the sky is falling, yeah, the sky yeah. is falling. And then finally someone said, look up. And they go, oh, <laughs> the sky is not falling, I'm no longer afraid. Maybe now I can be rational. Yeah, right, yeah. But the whole irrationalism was predicated on fear. It's no different today. A lot of the anti-intellectual, a lot of American politics today is driven by fear. You know, fear of immigrants, fear of being outnumbered, mm -hmm. fear of economic dislocation. And when people are afraid, the people who are feeding this information and anti intellectualism actually have the upper hand. Yes. Because that's what they need to satisfy their souls. Yes. Yeah. yes. And so people think about countering disinformation or anti intellectualism with rational thought and so forth. Actually, you've got to try to counter that fear first to get people. They've got to look up and see that the sky is not falling before you can talk to them. And so it takes that kind of um, pedagogy, that kind of uh, thought, uh, to deal with it in the first place. And so uh, I, I, I'd like to see us concentrate a lot more on people who really are afraid. Uh, they feel that life is vanishing. They feel that they're being overrun. They feel that they're being displaced, that culture is being canceled. Yes. You hear those kind of cries, you're not going to be able to have that rational conversation. Right that you want to have. But how do you actually say, you know, let's talk about the things you're afraid of and have a discussion as to whether you really need to be afraid, whether you have a reason for this fear, whether this, actually nobody's about to cancel the culture, even though that's a thought that that's going to happen. Uh, that immigration, and we're seeing this now with uh, a lot of the uh, talks about immigration, that people are being brought in to displace them and the great replacement theory. And once people feel like their whole civilization, a way of life is being destroyed and being displaced and they become so fundamentally afraid, you don't have much of a chance to counter the intellectualism. So one of the things I think we need to do is really um, find the source of the fear, the source of the discomfort, yeah. and have those conversations yeah. first. Yeah. And then maybe we can go on to other kinds of conversations. But as long as people, I, I, I saw this growing up in the Jim Crow South. Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> but uh, when people live in fear, I, I was telling this in a minute. I had a, actually my brother had a paper route to live in the Birmingham News, because down in the country. Right. <laughs> and he's right, he knows I wrote. <laughs> and on Thursday, we would get the Birmingham news with all of the big news and the yes. sales and so forth, and that was a big paper. So uh, I promised to help him if he'd give me a little bit of money. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't giving a whole lot. And that was this place where he would stop and say, okay, I get you a moon pie and a strawberry sandwich. <laughs> 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 but anyway, this one day, I was eager to get back, and it when I wasn't paying that much attention to it. And I had developed the habit of just on the bike throwing the papers and landing and so forth. And I threw this one paper and it was going over and I saw the wind blowing it right to, they said it was big, what they call picture windows or something? Yeah. It hit and that thing exploded. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And a lot of those rich white neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. And I heard the wife say, Ah, oh, the rest of the drop the bomb on it. <laughs> she was just screaming. The rest of the drop the bomb on it. The rest of the drop the bomb on it. And you think about it, that was a fear that we were taught at the time. Yeah. We used to have these drills about yeah. dropping the bomb. Yeah. They were just screaming. And there was nothing. And so finally the husband got enough nerve to peep out. Got <laughs> there and say to his wife, that ain't no Russian. <laughs> <laughs>
So you stayed and you took you you, you didn't run off. Oh yeah, I did. Oh you did. <laughs> <laughs> no one had ever said speed on the bike like that. I was going, and then when I saw my brother on his shoulder stop, I was like, no, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened, but it's that fear when people yeah. you can build up fear. Yeah. Right? People expect something to happen. Like, yes. you know, you raise and think that, yep, the Russian at any minute might drop a bomb on us. Or it could be. Uh, replacing them, bringing in immigrants to replace us. And so when people live and behave and think in the midst of fear, um, that's what we have to think about. How do we eliminate those fears? How do yes. we talk to them about those yes. fears? Yes. Uh, you're going to get policy and divides. People are going to line up and join all. I mean, <clears throat> and it's risen to the highest level of business and political leadership. The people now who are actually articulating the fears, cannibalism, people are eating babies, people are, I mean, this is stuff that's going on by the highest level of business and political leadership. And how do people at elementary, secondary, high education, the students that we face, um, how do we talk to people about those fears and how do we go back to the story to say, if you look up, you'll see the sky is not falling. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful metaphor. Powerful. And just a comment, the, the ineluctable question for universities is, so what is the culture, the climate here, and does it either reinforce the fears and divisions, or does it create a space in which people begin to understand different perspectives? I would argue, and I said this in my, ACE talk several years ago, we have become bastions of hypersegregation. That in so many settings, and it's something we've worked at at UMBC, we've worked to say, yes, there are times when we should be with people like ourselves. And whether from a religion, from a race, LGBTQ, or whatever, that's fine. But the question is, what is the university doing, each university, to make sure that students get to know people different from themselves, so that when they become leaders in our society, they can speak from personal experience about knowing people different and knowing there's a reason to work on trusting each other. Now that may sound whatever, but it is a reality. We've worked for years to mix it up. We've got kids from 100 countries, 60% have a parent from another country, but 20% black. Very proud of that, you know, Hispanic, Asian, white. And so we, in deliberate ways, in the classroom, and in cohort activities, make sure people are not just with their friends. You get what It's very important, because otherwise, as I say to new presidents in the Harvard program that I work with, um, when we criticize Congress, we're criticizing universities. Because all of the people in Congress came through our universities. Think about it. So they are our products. And unless we are changing attitudes and teaching people not simply to want to win the argument, then we, we find ourselves where we are right now. And so I would just say the work that Jim has done on the history of education and ways in which we have changed attitudes over time to get more opportunities for people is it, the kind of work that can help to shed light on where we are today. When people say we've never been so divided, I always say go back to the 60s. 1960s, 1860s, same thing. Over in my office, in my home, Looking over me all the time is a wonderful picture of Mary McLeod Bethune and Booker T. Washington, mm -hmm. who reflect for me those educators mm -hmm. who believe in what we're talking about. Here's a question about public facing scholarship. Um, and basically, the question is uh, what are the best practices to engage in public facing scholarship? without watering down academic standards. What was the question? What is the best way to engage in public-facing scholarship without watering down academic standards? Well, I, I would start by saying if there's one way to defeat public-facing scholarship is to water down uh, <laughs> academic standards. Because when people think uh, that you um, if you think so little of them, and somehow you have to give them a version of it um, that's watered down, um, 
they pick that up right away. Even students will pick that up right away if you in the classroom. They know when you're giving them your best, and they know when you think that maybe they're not up to it, or that somehow you got to change it, um, that you got to level down so they can be successful. That's where the disrespect and the disbelief and the lack of faith begins. Yeah, so. You, know, you, you really want to you know, just respect people um, and and give them your best and challenge them uh, because you just never know. You just never know who's sitting in front of you. You know, you, you just never know that capacity. Um, you know, it's um, one of the things that I, <clears throat> that I watch um, is these like America Got Talents or European Got Talents. These kind of shows. And someone will come out, and people are almost laughing at them because they just think there's no way that this person should be. And then all of a sudden, the person, the gift comes out, and everybody's like, "Oh my God!" Well, that's what happens uh, in public. That's what happens in church. That's what happens in schools. Is that um, you are looking out? on people and you have no idea what they can become. And the only thing you can do is give them your best and challenge them. Uh, you might do well to start from the assumption that they're smarter than you, <laughs> rather than to start from the assumption that they are somehow less smarter, dumb, and therefore you got to ward it down. Um, and I just uh, always feel that um, Once they know that you're giving them your best and that you believe in what you're doing, it radiates to them. Now imagine a coach in sports, like he's a sports metaphor. Yeah, but, and the first one, well, okay, you guys, I don't expect you to be able to do what they can do over here, so we're going to keep it at this level. Well, you just defeat it. And they're bound to be defeated. Uh, you got to you got to have that challenge at the highest level. And it's not that that somehow you are playing a trick on them. They can be better than you. And they can be as good as anybody else. And that's the way you got to approach them. You know, well, it's social science research, or science, the, the natural sciences, life sciences, public health research. I, I keep going back to my examples of my students. Uh, one of my students has invented a pacemaker for the brain. He's a professor at Duke, now black. Pacemaker for the brain to address schizophrenia and bipolar disease. And people can be amazed by that or afraid of that, that idea, right? And what he always says he appreciates from what we gave him at UMBC was the ability to talk to people with clarity without being condescending, right? and to bring their experiences into the work. And as he has worked on these issues, he's made sure that he's working with people of color in addition to other people. Same thing with Kismiki. If you look at her work, Kismiki Corbett, she did a combination of the social sciences and life sciences with us. Got a PhD in Chapel Hill in an agent. And, and she refused to allow Moderna to move ahead with the vaccine until there were enough African Americans in the study to show that it was effective, all right? So she called me and said, Doc, I want you and this doctor and Jackie to, to be in this so you can go out and talk about it. In fact, you're in it and it's okay. And it was very powerful, very powerful because some of her scientific friends didn't appreciate the fact that most black people don't trust medicine. They go back to the Tuskegee study and all those things, right? And what was significant about her approach though, if you ever look at her on TV, She's talking in a way you will understand whether you have a high school diploma or not. And because anybody who really understands the concept can explain it with clarity to a child, you know, without being condescending. There's the point. And so when we think about public facing research, one, we need to show people that they are involved, that it's not about something done with other people, that they are a part of it. Two, that you can trust us. And three, that it is perfectly understandable that you can get these concepts and learn from this in the way other people are. 
Thank you. As we are drawing near the end of this wonderful conversation, we have a final question from the audience, which I think really encapsulates a lot of what we've been talking about this morning, and we're going to ask you both to respond to it. Legacy is the cornerstone of any great leader, and you both are the epitome of leadership and brilliance. What do you see as your individual legacies? <laughs> <laughs> and my, my answer is very simple. My students are amazing. I, from those in science, but from those who are in public policy, um, some of the historians know my, my mentee, Derek Musgrove, and his work on Black Washington. Um, so proud of him, trying to decide whether he's going to go into administration or continue to be that great scholar. Right? He's not. He's not pushing for a presidency. But the idea of, of touching the lives of students. I, I would just use my mama, the Tuskegee graduate, example. At the end of her life, she had been an English teacher and a math teacher. I asked her, "What's important?" She said, and she had dementia, and she said, relationships. She said, and she could tell I was about to cry. I'm an only child, and I'm trying to hold it together. I'm a college president, and she said, my relationship with my God. She said, hold on to your faith. You'll be okay. And she said, my relationship with my husband, he's a wonderful man. She had forgotten that it died, and I had learned when they got dementia, don't remind them. You just leave it alone. Okay. But here's the point of the legacy. She said, but you know, I now understand that teachers touch eternity through their students. Ah. Teachers. Give my mom a round of applause. Teachers touch eternity through their students. It was true for her, and it was true for me. My students said, what's on your bucket list? I said, no, I could die tomorrow. I'm very serious. I just feel I will keep living through those students. That's my legacy. I think I would agree wholeheartedly with that. Um, I remember when I was a grad student here, uh, and I actually started buying books. I used to go to a lot of used books uh, places, and you know, I used to just go around to the union and sell them. Entrepreneurship. We get the money and have a party. <laughs> stare for a while because I, I knew the brilliance of W. B. Du Bois. Yes. Yes. And I thought there's no way his book but then you you, you realize in the same moment that that happens to all of us. Yeah. At some point. Yeah. Whatever you contribute in yeah. the way of research and writing at some point. Yes. There's a button. Don't get too carried away. Yeah. But at the same moment I thought not just about the book. Yes. I thought about so many of those intellectuals, yes. uh, like George Washington Carver, who was at Tuskegee in the uh -huh. and I thought, I kept asking the question, where, uh, what happened to George Washington Carver's students? And I realized he didn't have any PhD graduates. And what about the boys? And he didn't have any PhD graduates. Carver G. Woodson. And on and on. And I thought, they were denied that opportunity. Du Bois had a, a, a uh, adjunct position at the University of Pennsylvania to write one of the great yeah. books in sociology, The Philadelphia Negro. Right. But he was not on faculty there. He didn't have students. And so when I graduated, got my PhD, I was thinking initially since I graduated from Stillman about going back to Stillman, a place of life. And even coming back to Illinois, I thought, I can do something that they didn't have the opportunity to do at Illinois. Um, and I used to tell people back home, they said, what's Illinois like? I said, still water runs deep. <laughs> I said, Illinois is very understated, but they have tremendous resources yes. and tremendous quality. Yes. And you can do things here that you just can't do in yes. other places. And that's, a, in a nutshell, saying your legacies 
is Illinois in a way because uh, the students that I've had here, other places I couldn't yes. have even had the opportunity um, to work with students. Yes. And so, yeah, they will sell the book for a nickel. <laughs> but they won't be able to sell my students for a nickel. <laughs> somehow for us to get a photo of Jim with all of us behind him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's so important. This is a very, very special moment. And the word, it's not a nickel, but the word I would use when thinking about your legacy, Jim, and it's one that brings tears to my eyes. It's priceless. Yes. Yes. His legacy yes. is priceless. It's, it's just yeah. absolutely. Yes. So thank you. Yes. So is there a way who is the expert photographer? How can we do this? We'll talk right here. Okay. And we just kind of off the mic of everything. Okay. What do you suggest? I suggest that everyone gather in here maybe and have uh, Dr. Bright in front here. And Good. Good. And you can get up here. And yeah, so you can get everybody. Go oh. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. <laughs> continue to do and a legacy that lives through all of us in this room and beyond. We are eternally grateful for your sacrifice and for your commitment. Thank you so much. Uh -huh.